Professor of English, Writing Centre Coordinator, English Department Curriculum Representative, Faculty Co-Advisor for both the English Club and Campus Crusade for Christ. In addition, she serves each year on the College Scholarship Selection Committee and was recently asked to act as the Basic Skills Facilitator for the English Department. Maureen has taught a wide variety of English classes since joining Santiago Canyon College as a full-time faculty member in 2000. As a teacher, Maureen believes that she is engaged in a noble profession and that her work will outlive her. What she shows her students, they will use in their lives and pass along to others, forming an endless chain of learning. Maureen instructs students in the classroom and also teaches them by modelling the behaviours and attitudes that she wants them to exemplify. She is proud when she sees former students who tell her that they've gone on to graduate from four-year universities. In her personal life, Maureen is a busy mother of five children. She holds a black belt in Shaolin Kempo Karate and also enjoys music, poker, and politics. <laughs> Since the age of 14, she has been a certified counselor for the Orange County Sheriff's Department, working in the prison ministries with local churches and chaplains. One of her students commented, Professor Rowe is one of the best and most organized, clear, concise professors around. To date, she has also been the most inspirational, giving me the confidence to have a voice. Maureen is honoured to be acknowledged by her SEC peers, her colleagues and students are motivation enough for her to do a job that she loves. So this is extra recognition is very special for her. I give you Maureen and Ron. Super nice. <clears throat> I'm sure that if you were watching that introduction, that might have been just enough. I don't know if I have to say much more. With the quotes that were streaming and that great Russian music, that's called a mad Russian Christmas that we were listening to. And uh, my son's down there saying, do they, do they all look like that back then with all the hair? <laughs> Is that a good look back then? <laughs> But again, thank you very much for this award. And uh, I am very honored and a little bit more stressed to have my husband John and my oldest son Isaiah here today. All right. Now, when I was just beginning my stay at Chapman University, I told my parents two very scary things. The first was that I wanted to be an English major. And the second, and perhaps more frightening to them, was that I also wanted to be a philosophy major. Now these revelations were followed <laughs> by the standard parental questions of, what are you gonna do with that? Especially from my father. I always knew that I wanted to teach. I just wasn't sure whether I wanted to teach English or philosophy. And how thrilled was I to discover that I could possibly teach both because great literature is also great philosophy. So why the title of my little talk, What I Learned from the Russians? This is not going to have anything to do with being a communist. <laughs> no mention of Stalin or Lenin or furry hats or the little Russian dolls that fit into each other or how to look like Draco from those great Rocky movies. Not even about Reagan and that's a tough one for me but at least I can show a great picture of him. <laughs> My talk is about pieces of Russian literature that are also deeply philosophical. It's not just scary thinking about being an English slash philosophy major, but having these scruffy faced Charles Manson types as your role models, that's kind of scary. What appealed to me, especially about the Russians, were their lessons on how to live one's life. Questions like, what is it that men seek? We long for the truth, but the truth about what? What makes our lives meaningful? What makes it all worth it? So how did I come to know the two gentlemen starring in my talk today? Who introduced them to me? 
One of my first philosophy professors, Dr. Joseph Renzo, and he had scared him. My first real experience with Leo Tolstoy was in Dr. Kevin O'Brien's English 452, 552 Great Authors course. It was a mixed undergrad and grad class, and I was an undergrad. I was incredibly intimidated by the more literally sophisticated uh, grad students, but I was still feeling this recent fire that I got from my experience with Dostoevsky. I thought I was ready. So here's a little bit of information about Mr. Tolstoy. He was the son of prominent aristocrat, aristocrats. Cold he was frozen the frozen ground, the flame that burned away our dross is quenched forever without a sound. Quenched, now all is empty and cold. My heart aches and I feel within a pain. I cannot believe, though, that it must be told. And I want to weep, but all in vain. Farewell, our Tolstoy, our native son. Sooner or later, we must yield to fate. Farewell, thanks for deeds well done, for sacred words that have, yet, that have no date. You've taught us much. You've left us as much as life can ever leave. Your gospel, your works, shall bless us. You've much to, we've much to learn, much to grieve. Now, Will was supposed to do that in a Russian accent, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. In History X, if you've seen it, the main character is a skinhead creep who spends his time hating everyone who is non-white and ultimately ends up in prison for it and even helps his little brother get murdered, be murdered because of his beliefs. Here was a guy who, like Ivan, thought that he was doing everything right. He was living as he should with all the rest of his white power cronies. But it took a near-death experience when he is raped in prison for him to consider the pivotal question, the great question of that film that so much makes me think of Ivan. Has anything you've done made your life better? Now likewise, Ivan wonders that. To live? To live how? Perhaps I did not live as I should have. What if my entire life, my entire conscious life, simply was not the real thing? What is the real thing? The compassion of his son, as he grabs Ivan's hand and presses it to his lips and begins to cry. The compassion of Garrison, to whom he loved to talk, because Garrison did everything easily, willingly, simply, and with a goodness of heart that moved Ivan Illich. Garrison understood and pitied him. Real living, then, is not based on shallow pursuits to be like everyone else, the tedious demands of propriety, they cannot be the real thing. The last theme is this idea of death. What is death? Here, death does not inconvenience the public in any but the most superficial men and their tales. It's not what we thought. It's not always the dark and the dreary and the over our heads philosophical. Well, yes, it's philosophical, but it's touching on issues that we can and need to understand. The whole faith, hope, love, joy, friendship, sacrifice, family, conscience, morality, big T truths, compassion, salvation. And my final thought, I found this uh, very nice quote from Konstantin Muchowski, who said about these two men that they lived in literature. And I would encourage you to every once in a while try to live with them too. Thank you.